Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. Four years ago, tragedy struck the historic Mother Emanuel Amy Church in downtown Charleston when a white gunman killed nine black prisoners during a Bible study, forever changing the history of this church, city, and the entire state of South Carolina. On the night of June 17, 2015, nine black prisoners were murdered at Mother Emanuel Amy Church in Charleston. Clementa Pickney, Cynthia Hurd, Susie Jackson, Ethel Lance, Depay Middleton, Tawanza Sanders, Danielle Simmons, Sharonda Coleman Singleton, and Myra Thompson were murdered at the hands of a white gunman hoping to start a race war. It didn't happen. Instead, many of the victims' families made declarations of forgiveness, and people in Charleston and the state found unity in the act. The forgiveness is at the heart of the unflinching detailed portrait journalist and author Jennifer Barry Hawes paints in her new book, Grace Will Lead Us Home. She captures loved ones' final moments, fissures that came within the first several months of the intense spotlight, the removal of the Confederate battle flag from Statehouse grounds, and gives behind-the-scenes glimpses into the lives of those affected and the powerful moments, including the inspiring eulogy of Reverend Clementa Pickney by President Barack Obama. Through the example of their lives, they've now passed it on to us. May we find ourselves worthy of that precious an extraordinary gift, as long as our lives endure. Mm -hmm. May grace now lead them home. Grace will lead us home. The Charleston Church Massacre and the hard, inspiring journey to forgiveness is available now. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and Post and Courier reporter Jennifer Barry Hawes joins us this week to talk about her recently released book, Grace Will Lead Us Home. The book is an intimate look at one of the most devastating events in our state's history. Jennifer, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So this book just came out this month. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the goal of writing this book, this unflinching detailed account of you know, this, this horrible tragedy that we saw in South Carolina in 2015 up into, uh, you know, that first year, the trial, those moments. What was the goal behind writing this book and what made you feel like you needed to do it? Well, in a nutshell, I wanted to show a more complicated picture of what happened after this tragedy. Uh, a lot of people will remember that uh, the shooter was arrested the next morning, and then the following day he had a bond hearing. And at that bond hearing, five of the family members spoke, five people who had lost loved ones in this shooting spoke. And they spoke in Christian themes of forgiveness and grace and mercy. And it was a really beautiful moment, and it was heard all around the country and beyond, really. But it, it produced a fairly simplistic narrative of what happened. The people involved were not all forgiving. Uh, they were very different, complicated people, and were dealing with all kinds of other dynamics and, uh, and, and challenges. And I wanted to explore that to provide people a more complete picture of what happened. Mm -hmm. And even the details from that tragic night and then also up through the trial, I mean, you kind of really, you, you really got into all those nitty gritty details. How difficult was it to kind of work with the victims and the, the victims' families and the survivors that were a part of that? Well, it was difficult because obviously you're dealing with a tremendous amount of emotion. People's lives were thrown into, into chaos and um, it, it was difficult to find space in their lives to sit and talk a lot about what had happened. But many of them were very gracious about letting me sit and interview them, spend time with them. Um, it, it, it was a tremendous honor to be able to share that story. Um, but along the way, sometimes some people would be ready to talk, and sometimes other people would, and sometimes some would not. And I really tried hard to be patient, uh, wait until they were ready, so that we could tell as deep a story as possible. Mm -hmm. And that forgiveness narrative, obviously, it's part of the title of the book as well. Uh, and like you just said, it is difficult. They are grieving families. This was, you know, so immediate, so fresh, especially when. Uh, that forgiveness narrative really kind of started. And like you said, not all the families did forgive. What was some of the reasoning behind some of them doing so and then some, some not coming to that, that feeling? Well, at the core of that conversation is the fact that in the Christian faith, there is um, an admonition from God that you forgive as God has forgiven you. That, that's a central theme. So for those among the, which was really almost all of the family members who are Christians, that was an important thing to do, an important goal to work toward. Uh, for some, that quick forgiveness and an effort to be very quick about it came from um, a desire to not let their own anger and their own malice and sadness um, 
eat at them and destroy them because that doesn't hurt the shooter that only hurts them. Mm -hmm. And it only in the end would hurt your salvation if, if you're a Christian as they were. Uh, so for them it was um, a very intentional uh, religious goal uh, to do so. Now some were able to do it more quickly than others. For some it required a very long journey. And for a few that I know of, they, they still are not there yet. Mm -hmm. And then some felt moved in the moment at that bond hearing too. I mean, they didn't expect to stand up and say those things that they said and then and channeling their, their, their loved ones essentially, it sounded like for many of them. I thought that was one of the most interesting things is that I think people reading these stories or hearing this right after would assume that there was a concerted effort to communicate this and that wasn't the fact. Each of them described for me going to the bond hearing and actually not planning to speak. Um, uh, Nadine Collier, who is the first person to speak at the bond hearing, uh, is a very spunky, spicy, funny lady. And she described how she really felt her mother, her mother had died in the shooting, her mother's spirit come into her and guide her up toward the microphone and telling her on the way, you're not going to show your rear end right now, you're going to say these words. And she felt very much like that was something her mother would have said but not necessarily what she would have said right away. And that in fact, she felt that was her mother and of course, by extension, God speaking through her. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you just recently did an event at the College of Charleston and you did say that you kind of, there was a little bit of that on display between uh, Felicia Sanders and, and others during a question and answer. Can you kind of maybe elaborate about, you know, how some of these survivors uh, felt, you know, in their own words too? Well, and I think that moment was really indicative of this broader story. This was a launch event that the Post and Courier held at the College of Charleston to release the book and add it. A number of the family members came and, and Felicia, and there began this conversation about forgiveness and, and why forgiveness was important and, and some of the things we just talked about. And Felicia stood up and said that for her, forgiveness helped her maintain her sanity. It helped her not maintain a hatred for the shooter and for what he'd done so that she could move on with her life. And interestingly, her husband, Tyrone, stood and he said, no, he did not forgive. He was not going to forgive. He, he was angry. His son was dead. He, this was a racist shooter and, and he was not there. And I thought it was really interesting that just within this one couple, you can see the nuance of that story on display. Mm -hmm. And I've had someone comment on Twitter after we spoke on the podcast recently, uh, talked about how they said that forgiveness, the forgiveness narrative served as a very uh, important purpose for the book and for those in power. You know that that this this narrative taking root was important for people who were governing the, the you know Governor Haley at the time, President Obama, other folks in the Charleston area, and it sanitized black tragedy uh, in a convenient sort of way. How does that narr How does that mesh with when we talk about this forgiveness narrative and maybe people thinking? that it's kind of, it kind of is a, you know, maybe desanitizes it, a, a tragedy in this way. I think it's important to, to make a distinction between an individual forgiving and forgiving the shooter for his or her own reasons versus a more collective political forgiveness, which is different. That's, that's a community uh, response. And I think on the one hand, people were happy to hear those words because it helped to keep our city from rioting. If you remember, this was just a couple months after the Walter Scott shooting, so people were tense. Um, but what it also did, while beautiful, it, it gave cover. This is the argument of, of what you're getting at. It gave cover to people who didn't want to discuss racism and who did not want to um, discuss racial disparities in South Carolina, which are uh, extremely obvious in virtually any measure that you look at. So the question was, did that forgiveness keep us from having more meaningful discussions? So while it prevented rioting, perhaps, did it also keep us from uh, having the energy to really tackle these very deep-seated problems? I think that's where people feel like maybe um, we missed the boat a bit. Mm -hmm. and, and kind of along those lines, you uh, used President Barack Obama's eulogy for Clementa Pigney. Uh, it's in the entire back portion of the book, you include the entire speech. And it's interesting because he kind of spoke to the future after this tragedy. He was kind of looking forward, it sounded like, and to quote him, he said, uh, to settle for symbolic gestures without following, up, without following up on the hard work of more lasting change, that's how we lose our way again. It would be a refutation of the forgiveness expressed by those families if we merely slipped into old habits, or by those who disagree with us, slipped into old habits, where we shout instead of listened. Have we slipped back into old habits? I mean, what's what's it been like since 
this, this horrible massacre? Well, look more broadly, what have we seen? We've seen the country continue to struggle with racism. We've seen other violent white supremacists go into other houses of worship. You'll remember Tree of Life, the synagogue in Pittsburgh last fall. Uh, well, there was a synagogue shooting out in California just weeks ago. So I don't see a whole lot of uh, progress on that. I see where we're talking more about it, perhaps, but I'm not seeing where we're addressing the underlying issues that keep that from occurring. Uh, what's to prevent another one of these shootings from happening? I'm not seeing it. Mm -hmm. I see what we're doing is sitting a bit complacently and saying, well, um, that makes me very sad and I'm sorry for it, but what systemic changes have we made to reduce racism or to address racial disparities? You know, the Post and Courier last fall, we ran a big series on education, mm -hmm. talking about racial disparities in our public schools and the legislature uh, attempted to tackle that this year, but they were unable to pass anything. Now they could come back in January and do so, but once again, we're sitting here talking about it and there has not been a, a major change. And another factor was with gun control, and we never saw uh, much movement on the Charleston loophole, you know, closing essentially. Um, but I'm thinking also too, kind of going back to this heavily slipped into old habits, you know, there was that feeling of unity after the shooting. I mean, that the march on the Ravenel Bridge, uh, the movement to bring down the Confederate battle flag from Seahouse grounds, uh, just a lot of unity that we just, you didn't really feel, you haven't felt really since, but I'm wondering, you know, why has, why do, you, why do we think this, that kind of unity leaves us? Is it because it's been so many years after the shooting or maybe we didn't want to keep trying to keep things moving or what can we point to? One thing I thought was really interesting was uh, around the time of the first anniversary, the University of South Carolina did a poll and they asked people, did, did, did they think that as a result of the Walter Scott shooting and the Emanuel shooting, that race relations had improved? And white people were far and away more likely to say they thought race relations had improved. Black residents were much, much more likely to say they were in fact worse. There's a huge disconnect there in our state in perception. And I think maybe many white residents felt very proud that the state had remained calm, um, that they had even perhaps turned out at the Unity Walk and that sort of thing. But what black residents saw was that it took the deaths of nine people to get the Confederate flag down. And that as a result of those nine deaths, we did not see, for instance, to your point, uh, any reforms to, to gun laws, uh, particularly the background check. Mm -hmm. That was a piece that they really, really wanted to see passed. Um, of course, you want to think, well, what if Dylan Roof hadn't been able to get a gun? Perhaps things would have been different. We'll never know. Um, but the end result was that his background check was held up. And so uh, he did walk out with a gun a few days uh, after he went in to purchase it, right after his 21st birthday. So essentially, as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. uh, they really wanted to see that bill pass, and it wasn't. So, so I think some of the disconnect comes from um, the degree to which we see racism as a problem and the degree to which we're willing to take steps to address it. Mm -hmm. But maybe you can look more at the local level in Charleston, at least with city council passing, you know, hate crimes ordinance. And then, but also earlier last year in 2018, when they, when they passed the ordinance, they narrowly passed another resolution dealing with, you know, kind of apologizing for the role the city played in you know, the history of slavery. So um, obviously some people had some issues with how they wanted to go forward with that. But I mean, is that, is that a small step, at least at the city level? Uh, looking at what they're trying to do to maybe combat some of this problem? I think it's a small step. You know, that vote was still narrow, so it still speaks to exactly what, what we're talking about. And, that, and there was a city councilman who made the point of, the, why would I apologize for something that was so long ago? And I think therein lies some of the disconnect, is that for African Americans of this state, that history is very much alive, and it, and it plays out in the disparities, for instance, that we were talking about, and in many other factors. But uh, for many white residents, they said, well, why, you know, why do we keep talking about this? Why do we keep harping on this? There, there's, we're, just, we're having two different conversations. That's part of the problem. Um, but there is progress, for instance, with the apology. Um, it was shortly before or shortly after. I heard Mayor Tecklenburg speaking at something, and he uh, was discussing the workhouse, which is a place where people would send um, slaves to be tortured. We didn't used to hear conversations about places like the workhouse. Um, but there he was standing up at this forum discussing what it was and the realities of the torture that took place there. So we're having more of those conversations and that nut has been cracked a bit. 
but I, I still see a very large disconnect between what white people see uh, and what black people see here as, as the, the core of the problem. Mm -hmm. Jumping back into the book, you do incorporate a lot of historical you know, markers, monuments, and, and contacts into the book. What were you hoping to accomplish by using such you know, information uh, and background and, and kind of in spurts throughout the book? You know, I wanted the city to be a character in this book because the history of Charleston informs so much about the city. And I use the example in the book of the survivors that night. They left Emanuel with the police and they went right across the street, Calhoun Street, um, to a hotel and they wound up being moved less than a block to another hotel, which is an embassy suites now. And in that journey, they crossed Calhoun Street and walked past the 115 foot high monument to John Calhoun, who was a vice president, uh, one of the most ardent defenders of slavery. And they walked a little ways further to the hotel, which looks like a castle. Mm -hmm. And it was in fact built after a, a doomed slave rebellion in the city. Um, that was led by a man named Denmark Vesey, in fact, an Emanuel member uh, and class leader. They go into this building that was built as an arsenal after that to protect the city from future slave uprisings, mm -hmm. a building which then became the Citadel, whose cadets fired the first shots of the Civil War. So you realize that everywhere you go in Charleston, that, that history still lingers and um, in some ways festers because it's unaddressed, it's not, it's not been aired uh, we, we generally have glossed over that history. And mm -hmm. so I think in order for us to move forward, we're going to need to be much more honest about what that history was. Kind of like you're saying, bringing more of that to light and making it more conversational. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are also parts of this book that show division. You know, we were talking earlier about some within the families, you know, with the forgiveness narrative, but also looking at the church itself, Mother Emanuel Amy Church. Um, there were some issues you know, brought to light with Reverend Nor Norval Goff, uh, dealing with the money that kind of came in after you know, people were donating after the shooting. Uh, and he was replaced, and then Pastor uh, Betty Diaz Clark uh, came in, but then she seemed to get kind of drawn to the limelight too. What was it like those that year? I guess a lot of that happened within that first year uh, for the for the church and, and for some of the survivors that you interviewed and talked with. I mean, for them especially. Well, for the church, first it was um, a time of tremendous upheaval. If you'll remember, in the shooting, they lost virtually their entire ministerial staff. Uh, so they had this interim pastor, Nor Valgoff, who they, most of them did not know well. He had been a pastor in Columbia and had just recently been promoted to presiding elder, which is essentially the middle person between the pastors and the bishop. Uh, and so he was fairly new to them. He was certainly new to Emmanuel uh, as far as pastoring it. They had all these visitors. I mean, everything was in upheaval. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the survivors, the the conflict with the church that arose over the donations, but really more importantly for them, uh, they felt that the church leadership did not reach out and minister to them. They had tremendous spiritual questions, you can imagine, after something like this happens. Um, Felicia Sanders, uh, even just recently uh, at that forum that we were discussing, she said that she felt like the church leaders wish they all had died that day. I mean, I can't imagine the pain of that on top of losing your son and your aunt and witnessing all of this terrible violence. Um, that was what I wanted to explore, was that there was so much else going on for them uh, than, than the tragedy and then that forgiveness narrative. That was a piece of it, for sure. But they were dealing with all of this other stuff as well. To the point where she had to leave the church to find the spiritual mm -hmm. help that she needed. And interestingly, Felicia wound up going virtually right next door to a white church that had been the original worship home of Denmark Vesey, mm -hmm. the man I mentioned earlier, who went to Emmanuel to find his spiritual comfort. And when she found that out, she had some sort of, it seemed like an aha moment or it kind of gave her some good closure, it felt like. When she felt like, you know, God had led her on this journey and that that was closing this historical loop, this one historical loop in mm -hmm. the city, so. Another, imp another important person in your book was uh, then Governor Nikki Haley, who played a big role, obviously, in, in moving to not only kind of, I guess, keep the state together in a way, but also pushing hard to bring down the Confederate battle flag, which she saw as necessary to do at that time. Um, she attended all nine funerals of, of those parishioners, and she had a lot of behind the scene moments too, which you know the, the public didn't really know about. You, you kind of found out in your book. What did you see, how did you see her playing a role in this whole, this whole narrative and, and what she did in this, as a part of that? Well, I think one of the things that she brought was her own story. Uh, there's, a, there's a scene in there, and some people will be aware of it, 
when the House was debating uh, the lowering the flag bill, um, she went and spoke with the caucus and, and shared the story of being, a, you know, her parents, of course, are from India, um, being Indian American and growing up in a small town of Bamberg, and what it was like. You know, her father was is Sikh and wore a turban, and what it was like growing up feeling very much like an outsider. At one point, she and her father were driving to Columbia, and they stopped at a produce stand, and he was picking out some vegetables, and the owner called the police. So it was a, it was a situation, it seemed like, of racial profiling. So her father um, continues on, purchases his vegetables and leaves, but is stuck with her, and she shared this story with the representatives that day, mm -hmm. uh, and some were receptive and some were not. But I thought that for people in our state who are used to seeing her in much more of sort of a, a plastic role, it was the first time many of them saw her as much more human. Of course, she became choked up at the press conference um, the following day, the, the day after the shooting, that is. Mm -hmm. um, I think for her as a politician and a human, it was a it, it chance for her to seem uh, much more human and approachable. And then afterward, one of the most interesting things I thought was that she did and still does maintain a friendship with Felicia and Polly, and Felicia mm -hmm. in particular. So that Felicia was telling me uh, that um, when then Governor Haley was ambassador, they would text each other, and it was really meaningful to Felicia that the governor, or former governor, mm -hmm. took the time to have this relationship with her and cared enough about her. And when other people seemed to not, she really clung to that. And I thought that was an important piece of this to, to explain. And speaking of another survivor, Jennifer Pigney, who's the wife, widow of uh, Clementa, she faced an intense public spotlight too. Not only, you know, that first year, it seemed like mo probably the most, the, the toughest part of it too, and she had her two daughters with her, one who was with her during the shooting, uh, and then, then she loses her mother shortly before the year anniversary. So just a lot of things that affected her, and she didn't really, she was on the bond hearing, and she was kind of reluctant, it seemed like, to go to the trial. She didn't want to hear all those details. Um, but what was, what was it like working with her and just seeing her journey through all this, which, I mean, was, just really remarkable. Well, I thought it was so impressive the way that she really sort of hunkered down with their daughters to provide as normal of a life as possible for them. She wanted to be able to um, keep things normal, keep the routine, have them go to school, have them go to dance, and do all the things that they would normally do so that their suffering was minimized. Um, what many people didn't know was that at Jennifer's school, for instance, People had no idea that her husband was a senator. She did not wear that on her sleeve. Uh, she wanted to be her own person, and she wanted that person to be a private person. Uh, and after the shooting, that was not possible. It was really, it was really difficult for her to go out and be center stage. She felt like that was Clemente's role. He was much more comfortable there. Um, but she wanted to continue on his work, and she certainly wanted to carry on a legacy for him. So she made herself do that. She made herself go and speak at events. Uh, it was not her comfort zone, mm -hmm. um, but she she made herself do that. And on the flip side, she was always very respectful of her daughters and what they felt comfortable going to. Uh, and she uh, shared the story on the first anniversary, for instance, of deciding not to go to a lot of the events um, because her daughters um, didn't want to do it. In some ways, it's re-traumatizing. It's, it's um, not helping them with their grief. And so she didn't go, uh, e even though, you know, expectations may uh, expect her to be there. Mm -hmm. We have about three minutes left, but I do want to talk about the trial aspect, which you did cover the ins and outs of. And it was interesting because the New York Times review of your book did mention how you described Dylan Roof a lot. And you tried not to make this book about him, obviously. Um, but they, they talk about how you kind of reference him in his size a lot of times. Is that, was that intentional or was that just you trying to use description to show who he was, which was a small... A uh, young man who just got radicalized and became a, a racist terrorist, essentially. Well, I included that for two reasons. One is that uh, for most of the people I talked to, one of the main things that they remarked on was the fact that he he looked so young and frail. Because if you imagine him walking into this uh, to this Bible study without a gun, uh, I mean, he, he would not have been a formidable force. Mm -hmm. Um, also, I think it spoke for many of them to the idea that he was young. He looked almost prepubescent in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so how does somebody so young become so filled with hatred, so much to act and do this terrible thing? And so I included that also to sort of beg that question without saying it. 
is why, how did this young person come to feel this way so quickly and at such a young age? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I included it. Uh, it's hard not to think when you see him because he does look so young. I think we should all ask ourselves that. How does someone so young come to be filled with these ideas? Mm -hmm. And getting around close, like we saw online so much, and even more terrifying now when you think about how much actual fake news is out there and how that can influence people going forward, because we have seen it in, in the shootings since, unfortunately, at Houses of Worship. So with a minute left, uh, can you just kind of tell us a little bit, Jennifer, about how the church is doing now and that, how the community is doing now? Well, the church has had consistent um, pastoring since the first anniversary, so three years now. Uh, Eric Manning has been there, and I think they've f found much more of a footing in terms of, of there's not as many visitors, but there still are many visitors. They have tours and um, I think are more comfortable in the role that they've been forced into. Uh, it's a stop on the civil rights tour, and it's an attraction for other Christians, and both of those give them an opportunity to talk about the faith and the church's role in civil rights. Um, so, you know, they're, uh, they're finding their footing, but it's, it's difficult this time of year, yeah. it's, it's always going to be. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for your work on that book. Thanks to Jennifer Halls for joining us. And be sure to check out Jennifer's book, Grace Will Lead Us Home. Also, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a political podcast that can be found on your podcast app on any mobile device. Each week, I recap the weekly political news with the reporters who cover it. From the Kennedy Greenhouse Studio on the campus of the University of South Carolina, I'm Gavin Jackson.